this video, we're going to talk about the four functions of behavior. The functions mean all the reasons that someone might engage in behavior. We're going to expand this term reinforcement into four different types of reinforcement. A lot of people may learn or have learned five functions of behavior. It's not wrong or right. I'll just explain how the four functions encompass the five functions. And I think most people, once they learn the four functions, it's easier than those five functions. The five functions make it things a little more complicated, I feel. I'm going to work within the four functions. If not, we're all doing the same thing, saying the same thing. Anyone who strongly believes in those five functions, they split up one of these functions into two different things. And I'll explain why that makes it a little more confusing. The four functions, and I'm going to do this quickly, but I will do each function very thoroughly. The first is we have both environment and body. The first function, which falls under positive reinforcement, is gaining something from the environment. So access to tangible items, attention, or activities. And so when someone talks about five functions of behavior, they split this one into attention and usually tangible. But it's also activities or anything in the environment. The function is gaining anything. You say someone engaged in this behavior for access to whatever they wanted to access. The second one falls within negative reinforcement, and it's just negative reinforcement, and it's avoiding anything within the environment. So escaping anything, you could be escaping a tangible attention, activity. So these are actually... Like all the things that are in the environment should be in both these functions within escape and within access. I think most people go with escape. They're like, oh, they're escaping demands or an unpleasant environment, but they don't think they're escaping attention. They could be escaping attention or engage in behavior to escape attention. Socially, we actually do that quite a bit. Everybody does that at some point. So this whole idea of like, oh, access has tangibles and attention and escape only has demands. No, it's anything in the environment. So engaging in a behavior to gain something positive for the environment, positive reinforcement, or engaging in behavior to remove something negative from your environment or get yourself away from it, which is negative reinforcement. And then these other two are the body. If it doesn't happen within the environment and instead happens within your body, it is called, autom we call it automatic behaviors. The first one is to gain something positive in your body. And most of this is sensory behaviors. We all engage in sensory behaviors. Um, we might tap our fingers on our desk, play with our hair, lean against a wall, like rock our chair back and forth. Those are all sensory behaviors, the same as when an autistic child flops their hands. We're gaining, our body wants something neurologically, and so our body does something to gain it, and it feels good in some way. And so that is sensory behavior, gaining something positive from your body. And then we have our last one, which is the one where we don't actually, shouldn't work with this. If this is the reason someone is engaging in problem behavior, they need to go to the doctor. I'll talk more about that in a minute. Back to those contingencies, we're working under antecedents. So things happen in the environment, behavior, and then consequences. So access, the first one. So any kind of behavior to gain something positive within the environment. I'm not trying to give you two examples for every single one of these. So it's literally anything in the environment. What is reinforcing to me will not be reinforcing to you and vice versa. I might like a very bright room and you might hate a bright room. So I might engage in behaviors to access the very bright room and you might engage in behaviors to avoid the very bright room. Same with a cookie. I might engage in a lot of behaviors to gain a chocolate chip cookie and maybe you're allergic to chocolate and it will make you sick. So you would not engage in those behaviors to gain a chocolate chip cookie. Examples when people talk about ABA is falling within this. You know, the child does the homework to get the sticker. The child cleans his room to get extra iPad time. The child or a person goes to work to get their paycheck. A lot of examples fall within this category. And these four functions can describe all behavior in the world. 
They describe both our interventions, so we might modify things so that they engage in better behavior by giving them a reinforcer. And it also describes bad behavior, so we can observe behavior we don't want to see, know why they're engaging in that behavior, and modify the environment to make it so it's less, they're less likely to engage in that behavior. Access-seeking behavior, so we have attention-seeking behavior in a store, so the child might cry to get their parent's attention, and the parent gives them a candy bar to pacify them, so that would be positive reinforcement. And again, sometimes people engage in the behavior to access one reinforcer and get a second reinforcer because it's just what the environment did for them. The behavior will still be reinforced as long as that candy bar is reinforcing. Disrupting class for social approval, so they might make jokes because their peers laugh and they love the laughter. Every class clown situation or disruptive joking behavior, which we see a lot if you work in schools, is this. Social approval, so reinforcing. Everyone in the world is reinforcing, but I've definitely met a handful of kids who don't like it. But most kids love it. It's one of the most reinforcing things. And that's why that behavior is really hard to deal with because when they by making that joke, they're going to get that social approval. There's not a lot that I can give them that's better than that. Physical cues for affection. A toddler might engage in physical cues to gain affection, like pull on a hand, grab a parent, lift want to be picked up, all that's positively reinforced. They get that physical affection or whatever it is. Um, constant digital communication, social approval becomes a spoon stuff for the teenagers. And so that's very rewarding to get a text from your friend or read, you know, get a message, you know, get someone to post on your Facebook post. It's hard to beat that. Demand access to technology, so screaming for a tablet and then someone gives them their tablet. Dramatic storytelling for attention. A lot of people, you'll see, I have a child who's like the most dramatic storyteller, but everybody loves it. They laugh. They tell him he's a good storyteller, and so he just keeps doing that. Snatching toy instead of asking. You'll get the toy faster, so that would be positively reinforced. Escape is any behavior to remove something from the environment. Yeah. You don't like to avoid it or to diminish it, make it less. These are escape behaviors and it can be anything within the environment. What's adversive to me might not be adversive to you and vice versa. I might be fine with someone reprimanding me, but you might hate that. You got to be careful when working with this that whatever you're working with is actually adversive. Avoiding uncomfortable situations. So a student puts their head down to not answer a question in class and the person pretends not to hear someone calling their name to avoid talking. All that would be negatively reinforced behavior or escape behavior. I don't like answering questions in class and when I put my head down, the teacher never calls on me. So now they're more likely to put their head down in the future. Resistant to demands, the child throws a worksheet on the floor when asked to do homework. Whenever the child throws this worksheet on the floor, Nobody asks them to do that. Now they're more likely to throw their worksheets on the floor instead of engaging in the worksheet when you place that demand on them. A child says, I don't feel good when it's time to clean up and they get to go sit in the nurse's office. So they never have to clean up. So they're always going to do that. A student asks to go to the bathroom during a difficult lesson in schools. That is such a thing, right? A teenager leaves a dinner table when the sibling starts teasing them. So the teasing is adversive. If they leave the dinner table, they won't have to sit through the teasing. And again, that's probably not something we need to involve ourselves in. If it's really such a big problem, maybe they need counseling with their sibling. This describes all behaviors, not just the behaviors we work on. You can use it for everything. Fear of unpleasant experiences. A dog hides under the couch when they see the nail clippers. And so a lot of times, like, it's hard to get the dog out of the couch, so you give up. So now they're going to always go under the couch when they see that nail clippers. Sensory. So sensory behaviors are actions to gain internal stimulation. These regulate people. There's no social interaction or external reinforcement. These behaviors can be pleasurable or help with self-regulation. I don't recommend working on these unless they're leading to self-harm, property destruction, or harming others. If they're not harming anyone or anything, 
then these are just things that people should be able to do. Sometimes maybe there's a better one for them in like this moment, but they get to do their the one they like the best in this moment. So sometimes we might want to schedule these a little bit, but I don't like you should never stop someone from engaging in sensory behaviors because it is a lot of self-regulation. It feels good to our body. If you think about it, I play with my hair sometimes when I lecture. Like if an, another adult took my hand and put it down and said, don't do that, that's taking away so much body autonomy for me. It's embarrassing. It would feel horrible to me. So you have to think about it. It is similar to that when you try to stop people from engaging in their sensory behaviors. Spinning in circles for fun is a huge one. A lot of kids get a lot of fuzzy feelings from that and they might do that. Tapping fingers on desks is one. A repetitive pattern is often very soothing. Rocking back and forth is often something that feels really good in a familiar motion. Chewing on sleeves, huge one. If they've already had all their teeth and they're done with the teething process, then it still can feel good to chew. But a lot of times the chewing stuff is a teething. You're soothing your teeth. So it actually would fall under pain attenuation. But sometimes this is also a sensory. Sometimes it's hard to tell those two apart. Humming or making repetitive sounds, sometimes that feels really nice. Flapping hands when excited can feel very good to a lot of people. And then rubbing fingers or twirling hair. Pain attenuation is behaviors that are you engage in to escape discomfort, pain, or anything inside the body. Okay. When it is pain attenuation, similar to sensory, but even more so, we do not engage in behavior change. And so these are kind of the big ones with self-harm. A lot of kids might engage in head banging because they have a headache. They might engage in heavy scratching where they're causing themselves to bleed. And that often has to do with allergies, different things. And all of this is a doctor. This uh, Doctors need to deal with this. Also, stuff goes on in this area that can cause dueling some problems. It's not for behavior change. Like we're not going to stop someone from engaging in behaviors. It's just making their body feel better when they're in pain. That's unfair. That's cruel. That's unethical. And so when it is pain attenuation, we go to the doctor and try to find a medical solution to help them. A child rubs their arm after a shot to soothe the discomfort. A person rocks back and forth to help reduce the intensity of their headache. Scratching to relieve itching. They scratch a bug bite and alleviate the irritation and itching. So say they're scratching a lot of bug bites and they're scratching it all the time in school. To do behavior to on that so they don't scratch anymore. What should they do? They need to go to the doctor and get some sort of lotion or figure that out so they're more comfortable in class. To cope with tooth pain, the child clenches their jaw when they have a toothache. Pacing to distract from the pain. This is something that a lot of people do. I mean, you just looking at women in labor and like kind of the things women want to do when they're in labor, like a lot of that stuff is just to distract. And so you just want to make sure you're not engaging in behavior change if they're doing something to distract from the pain. And then applying pressure for relief. So the child applies pressure to their temples when they feel overwhelmed to soothe the tension. Massaging sore muscles. Person massages their leg if it's discomfort or they have stiffness. And then releasing the gas pain in infants. So the baby cries when they have gas pains and that gets someone to burp them or do the little leg thing. And that relieves the discomfort. So you don't want to do behavior change on that crying. You want to offer them a solution for the discomfort, which with babies, most of the time, a mom or a caregiver can figure it out. But sometimes it's so bad they do need to go to the doctor. And that's really what colic is. It's often digestive issues for a baby and you want some medical help when it's colic. We don't want to do behavior change on tantrums for colic. So why it's super important to understand all this. One more thing about pain attenuation that will come to me. We want to understand the behavior function helps us know what to do. So you know when to send them, you know, let's go look at the medical reasons and get them some help. You know when to help them with when to let them self-soothe and engage in sensory behaviors instead of do behavior change. 
And then you know when, you know, they're engaging in that for positive reinforcement. So they want to gain something. Let's give them a better way to gain that thing they want other than that behavior. It dictates how we're going to um, intervene with all kiddos. The same behavior can have different functions. So like crying, serve different purposes. It might be access, escape, sensory. And then it, ob observing patterns help predict and understand the behaviors is also important. Oh, the other one, pain attenuation example that a lot of people use is ear infections. Every caregiver who's had a child knows they got fussy one time and that you couldn't understand and they were engaging in probably annoying behaviors that you don't want to see. And lo and behold, you take them to the doctor and they have an ear infection. They just couldn't communicate that their ears hurt, and so they acted in that way. We wouldn't do behavior change on those behaviors because if their ear hurts and there's a medical solution. There's antibiotics to help make their ears feel better. And so that's another example of pain attenuation.